Thank you. Thank you very much for this very flattering introduction. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Um, just before we start, uh, just to have an idea, uh, who among you is 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 doing nuclear reaction theory for a living, or nuclear reactions anyway? Yeah. Yeah. No, not sure. Okay. So that's not uh, the, the main part of the audience. So I'll try to be to start from the from from the basics and then and then uh, climb up uh, uh, a little bit. So here is the the plan uh, of of the lectures, but that plan can be adapted and changed uh, depending on what what you what you prefer to see. Um, so today, what we'll start is 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 doing. Uh, um, quant in, an introduction to quantum uh, collision uh, theory. So first, I will try to motivate the interest of, of doing uh, nuclear reaction theory. So why, or nuclear reaction to measure nuclear reaction anyway. So why do you, do we measure quantum uh, collisions? Um, and I will um, then look at, diff there are different ways to solve the Schrodinger equation in, in for collisions, and I will uh, uh, look in particular way to the partial wave uh, expansion and and introduce the notion of phase shift, which is something which we will use later in the uh, in, in in the classes. And if times allow, I will finish with the looking at the notion of of resonance, which is also closely related to this uh, to this notion. Then tomorrow morning uh, we'll start by looking that everything I've told you today is nearly useless. And because the problem is that there is Coulomb scattering. So, uh, but you can solve the problem and, and, and come back to the notions that, that we'll see today. So today is not fully useless. Um, and then we'll see the notion of, of, of optical model uh, uh, tomorrow, and then I will do an introduction on halo nuclei. You have already seen that notion with uh, Professor Meng. Uh, I will go more into the direction of how these nuclei were discovered and why reactions are important if you want to study these these kind of, of structures. Um, and this will be actually the, the two last points. So the notion of optical model and the introduction of halo nuclei will be the basis for the exercise. And I suggest to switch a little bit the plan. So to do the exercise on the morning of Thursday uh, using the code that uh, is available now on, on, on the website. So you can download it and, and, and compile it. And then in the afternoon, we'll see different ways well, model is probably not what I should have used. Um, it's it's different methods to solve the Schrodinger equation. The notion of model is more. So it's something that we'll see more on 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 Wednesday. Um, so we'll see a couple channel way to solve the Schrodinger equation, then a, a time dependent approximation uh, approach, and then the icon approximation. That's what I'm what I'm doing in 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 the research. And then on Friday we'll come to the important part of of the uh, of of the class, which is what happens during these breakup reactions. So, what's the dynamics of the of the breakup reactions, and what can we actually actually probe in breakup reactions? So, what what can you infer? What kind of structure information you can infer from these from these reactions? Um, so, uh, I will start. Uh, so this 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 would be the first class. So I will start with a I take a leaf out of, out of the book of Rick Caston, uh, who taught in two thousand four at a summer school in in Surrey, and which which I attended, but then uh, as as a student like like you, and he started his class with uh, saying his word uh, tins tasks, and so that's not Finnish, that's not uh, Danish or whatever Nordic language. It's just the acronym of there is no such thing as a stupid question. And um, th so this means that uh, don't be afraid to ask, to interrupt uh, if you have questions. And then uh, I I'll, try to, I'll try to answer, answer them. The, the most stupid questions are usually the most difficult ones. So uh, 
I hope I will be able to to answer to answer these questions. So, just before we start uh, for the exercise session, so there is a code, a Fortran code. I'm sorry, I'm yeah, definitely from the past century, uh, and so I still code in Fortran. And uh, so th there is a code which is the scattering C. So scattering C is scattering complex. So it's use a complex potential, optical potential. Um, and uh, you should download it and try to compile it. So we, I've, I have exchanged with a couple of you about this this uh, this code. So uh, the, the general comment is, if you have G Fortran installed, if you have another compiler, it could be uh, in the Intel Fortran compiler. You just use that comment. Uh, if you don't want, if you have a problem with the minus O, uh, what you can just do is is G Fortran. Uh, and then scattering c dot f, and that will give you a, a dot out executable, and then you can just start with the a dot out, and so the, the comment would then be a dot out minus b ten c twelve e eighteen dot that, which is the the input file uh, I've given you, and so you can you can run it and make sure that the output looks exact looks exactly as as the output that is also provided. So if you have problems, so we've solved some of the issues. Um, I've tried and I had no warnings, but then this is strongly dependent on strongly compiler dependent. Part of the code was coded in Fortran seventy seven. Uh, yeah, I know. Uh, so. Uh, um, 1977, so just to be sure. Um, so you will have, you may have some warnings, just ignore the warnings. It's just because the way it was coded is is is, is an old fashioned way and nobody code, codes like that anymore. So if you have problems, come on me either by email or we can discuss after the class or during the breaks uh, or, or anyway. So uh, the class today will start with the notion of quantum collision, uh, notion of cross sections. This is something that you probably have seen in quantum mechanics um, during your undergrad studies. Um, and um, uh, then we'll see how to solve that with the, with the partial wave expansion. Uh, and, 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 and if times are low, once again, uh, we'll see the notion of, of, of resonance. So quantum collisions are used for different purposes. Uh, the first purpose is, and that relates to the previous lecture, uh, to uh, exactly what was mentioned at, at the very end of the of, of the lecture. So you rely usually on data, on nuclear data, to fit your your interaction, uh, and and it's it's the goal to learn about something about the interaction between the particles. So you just have the particles, you collide them, you look how they scatter to uh, from each other. And from there, from the way they scatter, you learn about how how they interact with each other. So that's the first thing. The second one, and that's more what I'm going to look at the end of, of the lecture. So the, for the last two, for the last two days, it's to analyze the structure of particles, atoms, uh, nuclei. So we'll look at, at nuclei, and in particular to these halo nuclei, these exotic systems that was introduced uh, last week. And then a third application is to just measure uh, reaction rates that have some applications. It could be nuclear astrophysics. You need, uh, as, as we've seen um, uh, yesterday, you need reaction cross sections to, uh, to, to, to model stars. So you, you, you need to measure them in the lab and then hopefully infer the reaction that, that is the, the, the cross section of astrophysical NREX, but it could be also uh, you you want you want to have a nuclear reactor. You need to know the cross sections uh, for the for the fission, for example, induced fission, as you've seen with uh, uh, Nicholas uh, last week, or how to produce radioactive isotopes, which have some applications, military of course, but uh, also medical applications. And so here is the measure the measurement scheme. So usually you have a sort of a beam. Uh, it has to be collimated. Um, and then, and then once it passes, hopefully it it it's it's more or less like a plane wave, and so parallel the beam is hopefully parallel. It impinges on a target, and then on the target, these incident particle scatter with the nuclei inside inside the target and scatter in the in the different 
uh, directions. And then you put a detector here at a sort of set, certain angle with an opening angle, uh, delta omega. And you look at how many particles have been scattered or how many reactions have uh, have taken place. And then you have an unscattered beam that goes forward. So you can't actually put the detectors at too forward an angle. Um, so this is a uh, theory viewpoint, okay? So uh, that's how we as theorists believe that the people do the experiment. The reality is much more complex. So this is a picture taken at the Laboratorio Nazionale del Sud. Uh, and this is uh, in, in, at their radioactive ion beam facility. Uh, and this is the, 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 this is the uh, big hodoscope uh, that they have uh, developed. So you see, um, Professor uh, Cardella, uh, still black hair, so it was a few years ago. Um, and um, well, actually, my wife is here. And uh, so what you see is that you have lots of diff yeah, um, cables and, 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 and everything. So the beam are actually comes from the left. The target is here. So that's this. And it's, it's something with the, that you can move up or down, and then you can have different kind of, of targets. And these are delta, uh, delta EE telescopes, all mounted on a on a sphere, uh, focusing at 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 the at, at the at the target. So that's really the the goal. And as you see, there is a hole here because the unscattered beam goes goes through there, and you don't want to put detectors in 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 the beam, uh, in. In the beam, so you see that this is a much more messy and complicated and difficult than what we uh, than what what we do in in, in theory. So um, there are different kind of reactions. So when you have particle A and B that comes and collide together, um, the first possibility is that they're basically merely scattered from each other. They change the direction. They exchange momentum. Uh, they exchange a pion, as we, we've seen. Uh, but they are just scattered. Nothing happens. They stay in their uh, initial uh, ground state. So nothing happens. This is elastic scattering. Now, you exchange momentum, but you can also exchange energy. And so part of the beam energy can be transformed into an excitation energy. So you can have one of the two particles getting A or B being excited, but their structure is unchanged. Uh, and so this is what we call the inelastic uh, scattering. Then if you go slightly higher in the exchange of energy from the, from the beam, you can have this excitation that goes higher in, than what but then, then some threshold, and, and then the particle breaks up. Uh, one of the particles, for example, A in this case, breaks up into a core and a fragment. And, and, and so this is the, what we call the breakup reaction. And this is what we are going to focus uh, on, on the end. So starting, well, tomorrow we'll start about the description. So uh, this would be uh, to see tomorrow. And then uh, 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 another possibility is, is re rearrangement or transfer. Basically, you have a transfer of particles from one, well, particles of yeah, more elemental particle from one nucleus to the, to the other, transfer of, of neutrons uh, from, from one to the other. So just, just to take these four, these four examples, so the first one, the one that we'll, we will actually study during the, the exercise session is when you have a beryllium-11 impinging on zinc-64. Um, and then the beryllium-11 comes out uh, in its initial ground state and, and zinc-64 is, is, is untouched. So this is the elastic, this is the elastic scattering. This is exactly what, what we're going to look at uh, uh, tomorrow. The second possibility, so the inelastic scattering is your beryllium-11 impinging on zinc-64, 64, sorry, zinc, 64, and then it it get it get it get ex, it gets excited. Uh, Barium eleven has a one half minus excited state, and then it breaks up. So there is no um, the, the other states are not no no longer bound, and so uh, this is what uh, what happened, and this would be the inelastic uh, the inelastic scattering. So there you can learn something about the structure of these excited states uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and other kind of, of, of information. The third one, so the, the breakup would be 
beryllium 11, and we will mention that during the exercise session. Um, it impinges on zinc, but then what happens, as I've just mentioned, the, the one neutron separation threshold is very low. It's about about half an MeV. Um, and so it can easily break up into the beryllium 10 in its ground state plus a neutron plus zinc uh, 64. And this is this is the breakup uh, of, 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 of beryllium 11. And we will discuss that in more detail uh, at the end of the of, of the class. And then for the transfer, I could also mention a transfer on, on zinc, but the, that's not really what, what is usually done. If you want to study beryllium 11, you send beryllium 10 uh, on, a, a, on a deuterine target, and then you transfer a proton for the deuterine, which is also loosely bound, bound by 2-MeV, uh, to form beryllium 11 uh, plus, plus a, a, a proton. And that would be the transfer, which is also a reaction that is uh, often studied to to use to study the structure of exotic uh, nuclei. So here is is the uh, the, the type of of of, uh, of of reactions uh, that can that can happen. The other kind of reactions, more deeply in elastic, uh, are possible, but I won't discuss that. So the first thing I want to mention, yeah. Say that again. Um, yeah, okay. So uh, neutron-induced fission. So these are more direct reactions. So what happened in neutron-induced is that uh, you will mostly form a compound nucleus, which is excited, and then which will, which will decay. This is not the kind of direct reaction. So you have that, ha that asks to have a capture of a neutron, so, for example, in well, uranium two thirty five, which is fissile, you send a neutron, low energy neutron. We'll see that during the class um, next today, uh, tomorrow, tomorrow. Sorry, um, and then you form uranium two thirty six in an excited state, which then de excite by evaporating neutron first and 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 fission, as we you've seen with uh, with Nicolas Schuck. So it's not really one of the kind of reaction that I will look because the time of the full reaction will be larger than in the direct reaction where you assume that you do not go into a you do not form a compound nucleus which then evolves into one of the of of these uh, of these of these channel okay yeah 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 so you can have a excited either a or b or both so you you could you could have both that get excited uh yeah yeah so what what usually people would would do it to exclude that that kind of 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 of, of channel is to uh put a gamma detectors around the target and because it's electromagnetic, it's very quick, so you can uh, measure the gamma, and then you can uh, the experimentalist can um, uh, decide. Okay, I don't want that gamma, which would correspond to the excite the excitation of the of one of the states that you don't want. So, if you don't, for example, want to have A to be excited, you if you know the structure of A, you know which are the gammas that can come out, and then you can say when you receive one gamma, you say that this is not the reaction that you want. So, yeah. No, no, you measure the gamma, so you know what with if if I take this this reaction, what will happen later is a stay a, b goes back to the ground state, and then you have a gamma, and the gamma is the energy of the gamma is directly given by the spectrum of a and of b. And so if you know that spectrum, you can gate on that gamma or ungate. I don't know how the experimentalists say, but they exclude this kind of measurement, saying I don't want B to be excited. So uh, once I receive a gamma, I know that this is not what I want. Okay. So on on the 
the first thing I want to mention is this energy conservation. So the first, so the, the, the total energy should be conserved. And so that means if I come back to the, to this, so I have this reaction, uh, sorry, A plus B goes to a sum of products I. Uh, so you have a reaction uh, and any kind of, of, of reaction and the energy has to be conserved. So that means that the mass of A is the energy, the mass energy of A plus the kinetic energy of A plus the mass energy of B uh, plus its kinetic energy has to be equal to the sum of the mass uh, of, 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 the, of the energy mass of the products plus their uh, their kinetic their kinetic energy and so we define in a reaction we define the notion of 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 the q value and the q value is uh the energy produced by the uh by the reaction and i i, I put quotation marks because it's 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 not the, the the whole energy. What what I mean by that is that the Q value is equal to the mass energy of the uh, of 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 the incidence of the initial particles or sorry of the initial uh, nuclei minus the sum of the uh, Minus the energy of the the, the 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 mass the mass of the of the product, and so um, and so uh, in 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 that case, what will happen is that the, this characterizes the 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 reaction. So if Q is positive, then the reaction is said to be exo energetic. So it's produces it produces energy it is energy energy sorry it is an energetically possible so it's that that channel is what we call open it is always open it does not depend on the incident energy uh, incident kinetic kinetic energy on the other hand if q is negative then you call the reaction is endo energetic and so it it needs An in, a, a minimal kinetic kinetic energy to take place so otherwise the channel is is uh, the channel is, is 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 closed and so um to be what we call open um So it needs a kinetic an, an incident kinetic energy in the center of mass reference frame, which is larger than minus Q. So if Q is positive, if it's ed, uh, if it's exoenergetic, it always takes place. If it's endoenergetic, if it, it means that it requires a certain level to be uh, to be to be possible, and so as a side note, uh, the um, the elastic channel has Q equal to zero, and so it's always open. So you can always have a reaction that takes place. So you can always have the scattering. In elastic scattering, uh, breakup transfer, well, in elastic scattering and breakup will always require a minimum uh, en energy because you need to transfer energy from the, uh, from, the, from the projectile target relative motion towards the excitation energy. Uh, for transfer, in some cases, you have exoenergetic reactions, sometimes endoenergetic reactions. 
so the, the now what I would like to address is the is the notion of of uh, of cross section and put the a bit the, the theoretical framework in 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 which we work. Um, so to to introduce this notion of cross section, so I go back to my very simple uh, purely theoretical uh, 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 scheme. Um, and so what what I will use is is that in the incident beam, I suggest that there is um, Fi, which is the incident flux, uh, the, it's the incident flux of, of, of particle. Okay, so the, 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 flux, the flux of particle. In my target, I will assume that there are n possible nuclei that can interact with the particle of the beam. So n is the uh, number of particle in in the target. Um, so for us, the addition it seems very simple. You take the you take the volume of your target, multiply by the density, and uh, and that's it. You get the number of particles. But it's something you need to know that density. You need need to know the thickness. And I recently had an issue with a colleague of mine who sent me cross sections, and then he double checked. He, uh, and noted that he used the wrong density uh, for the target, so he got the cross section wrong by a factor of two. So that's a, that can be a problem. Um, as long as you get it before before publication, it's 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 all right. Um, and then delta n, what I will call delta n, is the number of events detected per unit per unit, unit time. So it's it's the number of 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 events that you will measure in your in your in your detector. So very naturally um, we know that or we can understand that the number of events that you will measure is actually proportional to the incoming flux. The more particle you send on your target, the more event you will measure. Okay, that's at least that it should should be, um, and it should be also proportional to the number of particle or number of scattering centers that you have in your in your target. So if you take a thick target, then you get more uh, more reaction. So now, if you are if you are an experimentalist, you know also that if you have a thick target, you can have double scattering, and so that can be a problem. So the the the, the beam particle interact twice with the nuclei in the target, so that can be a uh, that can be an issue. And the the factor of proportionality between these three uh, uh, notions, the, these three values, is actually the cross section that we usually measure as a sigma. So this delta sigma is actually the ratio between the number of events that you actually measure divided by uh, the number of incoming, well, not the number of incoming particles, by, by the incoming flux of particles and the number of, of scattering uh, of scattering target. So just to, it looks like, it looks like a, pro, a probability, but it has a dimension. The dimension of the incoming flux is actually a number of particles um, per uh, unit surface uh, and and uh, unit 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 time, so it has it has a dimension. Well, the dimension of a number is a number, so it it has no it has basically no dimension. So the dimension of n is just a number. When I put these uh, square brackets here, I mean I mean the dimension of of these. And l is a is a length, t is a time, m is a mass. But here there is no no mass so far. Um, and so uh, it's delta n, the, the, the units, the, 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 the dimension of delta n is just a number per unit time, so it's a, it's a number per, per time. And so therefore, the dimension of delta sigma is um, a, number per, a number per unit time divided by a number, so that does, doesn't matter, divided by a number 
uh, divided by L square and divided by time. So that dimension is 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 a length. It's is a surface. Sorry, it's a length square, and um, the unit we use for that is the is the the barn, and one barn is ten to the minus twenty four square centimeters. Um, it's 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 weird. Uh, it's a weird unit, uh, and so contract uh, uh, by contract. Um, we are all obliged to say cite at least one time the Big Bang Theory. And so uh, here is Sheldon Cooper um, when, I don't remember in which, uh, in, in which season, but at, at one point he devised a reaction, a nuclear reaction, to produce a super heavy element. Um, and uh, <clears throat> he forgets that the barn is not 10 to the minus 24 square centimeters, but it, he thinks that it's 20 minus 24 square meters. And then his reaction cross section uh, at the end uh, are, are wrong, uh, but the super heavy element is found anyway. So I don't, I don't really understand the, how, how the guy did, but anyway. So, and then just passing by uh, Michael Bloch uh, from uh, from Mainz and, and and the GSI has told me that these reactions were actually tried at Darmstadt and and other places to try to synthesize these heavy elements and none of them work. So uh, it's definitely an, a, a problem of cross section. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have one hundred Fermi square. You can, you can. Yeah, that's that's an important value to know when you do the calculation because the, usually the codes are written with your units as Fermi, but we want to get the bound, so you we need to have this one hundred factor one hundred. Um, now the the thing is because what what you do is is you measure here. Uh, this as a function of 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 the angle of the scattering the scattering. Of the scattering angle, um, uh, the, the, what we what we the important notion is is the notion of of differential cross section. So as in the direction uh, omega, and this is basically the limit for delta omega going to zero. So you assume, yep. Oh, sorry. No, you don't think you you are right. Sorry. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the um, so it's the limit for delta omega going to zero. So you assume yeah, that that your detectors are uh, become smaller and smaller. So that's that's a dream of a theoretician is to have infinitely small uh, detectors, and then of course the experimentalists don't want that because otherwise they don't measure anything so or they spend their whole day waiting for one one element so but you need that's the big job of the of the experimentalist is to take that into account and to take to do the, the extrapolation and so it's this delta sigma divided by uh, <clears throat> divided by by delta uh, by delta omega so it's the limit for Delta omega going to zero of delta n uh, divided by fi, so coming flux number of particles in the target delta omega, which is the opening of the uh, of of the of the detectors. Um, just one last thing: if you assume that this is in the z direction, um, then you have, in most of the case, you have. An invariance with with omega, and therefore your cross section actually depends only on 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 the on the um, uh, on the co latitude uh, theta, not on the azimuthal angle. So you have you have you have an invariance with regards to to phi. Um, so. We consider now this. This we we go back to this uh, theoretical uh, reaction. We have two uh, particles that collide with with each other. So we have a particle B and a particle A, and um, uh, 
So they all they both have a coordinate in the chosen uh, reference reference frame. So you have R A and you have R R B, and then the difference uh, between them is the relative coordinate is R. So it's it's this uh, this radius. So the problem that now we have to we have to to solve the the Hamiltonian of that of that problem is um, the kinetic energy of A plus the kinetic in non-relativistic quantum mechanics kinetic energy of B plus an interaction that depends on the relative uh, coordinate. So we have a six-dimension problem. So it's uh, three for R A, three for R B. I neglect spin. If you add spin, you have another two uh, two dimension to take in well two dimension well depending on on the spin of the of a and b so it it it, it starts to be uh, to be complicated um and this is not uh, this is not the ideal so just just to make sure so ti is minus h bar square laplacian of uh, ri divided by twice the mass uh, the mass of particle uh, particle i and so this is not this is not ideal because R is 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 a combination of of uh, R A and and R B and this is not uh, this is not the ideal way. So what we'll do is we change reference frame, and the best way to do here in this case is to remove the motion of the center of mass. So you have just a short, short reminder: uh, the radius, the position of the center of mass is the mass of A times R A plus the mass of B times R B divided by the total mass. So big M is M A plus M B. And um, so if I go back to this scheme, uh, assuming that B, for example, is 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 uh, heavier than, than A, then you have this R C M. Uh, placed uh, placed here, and so just to be complete, it's just R A minus R B here. And when you do the change, when you do this change of of um, when you do this change of uh, of variable, what happens to the Hamiltonian? Uh, it's it becomes actually a kinetic energy depending of the of the center of mass. Plus the relative, the kinetic energy in the relative uh, coordinate plus uh, plus this uh, this this interaction, and so what what this means is um, so where um, T R C M is just minus h bar square Laplacian for R C M divided by twice M, so the total the total mass, and TR is um, minus h bar square population R to mu, where mu is what we call the reduced mass, and it's it's the product of the masses. Uh, divided by by their sum, and that's this is what we call the reduced mass. And so, thanks to that, as as we 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 can see here now, the Hamiltonian splits into two Hamiltonians. So one which depends only on R C M, and one which depends only on 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 little R. So what we have is actually. The, the Hamiltonians is the Hamiltonian for the motion of the center of mass um, plus the Hamiltonian uh, depending on uh, on the relative position. So you only depend here on the relative uh, on the relative motion of the two of the of the well you have you have one Hamiltonian for the center of mass motion and one for the relative motion. And so uh, thanks to that, what we can know now is that this wave function, the total wave function, uh, which depends on Ra and Rb, is actually the product of a wave function for the motion of the center of mass 
which will depend on RCM times the wave function uh, for for uh, the relative the relative motion. And so we are divided now instead of a six dimensional problem, we just have a two. Uh, we have twice a three dimensional problem, and um, this means that we can treat each of these uh, of these Hamiltonian uh, separately, and that's what we we're going to do uh, now. So for the standard of mass, we go back to this uh, to this notion. So the the Hamiltonian is just a kinetic energy term. There is no potential term. So it's the Hamiltonian of a free particle of mass m of the total mass of the system. Just to make sure m is m a plus m b. So that's the total mass of the of the of the of the system. And that motion is described by is described by a plane by by a plane uh, by a plane wave. So we've seen that in 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 Jérôme Margueron's uh, lecture uh, yesterday. So we have you have you have a you have a plane wave. It's just a free particle moving on a on a, on a, on a straight line um, with with an energy that is related to the to the uh, <clears throat> to the to the wave number of the of the of the motion. I've used this particular uh, factor. It, it's this. I chosen this 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 um, um, this normalization in order to get uh, to get to get this uh, this orthogonality relation. So this is a factor three. Uh, there was already that factor three uh, two pi at the, at the power minus three half coming in 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 the class yesterday so here it's 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 just to say that why i use also that um that uh, that normalization and so this means that the center of mass moves in a, in 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 basically in a straight line as a as a plane wave and you're back to galilean inv invariance so we're th this is a good a good thing so especially in this institute so we're 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 back to uh, to Galileo's uh, uh, physics, and, and 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 we can remove remove that, and it all means that the the whole physics depends only on the relative motion between the two particles, which of course fully makes sense uh, to us, but it's it 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 explains where it where it comes from. So the Hamiltonian has a kinetic term plus uh, plus a uh, plus a potential, and that kinetic term. Um, it, it corresponds actually to the motion of a particle of a virtual particle of mass, which is the reduced mass of the two particles. So just to make sure, uh, I repeat the definition: it's m a m b divided by the sum of the mass m a plus uh, plus m b. So it's a one particle of a virtual particle that does not exist. Really, but uh, it has it has a, a mass which is a reduced mass, and it evolves in uh, in a field in an external field which corresponds to the interaction between the two uh, between between uh, between the two particles. And we will look at what we call stationary scattering states, and so these states are the solution of the Schrodinger equation, but which have an asymptotic behavior, which is this one. So you're we're back to this. Factor two pi at the power minus two uh, two third uh, three half sorry, um, and uh, which is this normalization uh, chosen, and you have an incident. You have you have two terms. You have a plane wave, okay, and then you have an outgoing spherical wave, and that wave is um, varies. So the magnitude of that wave, the amplitude of that wave, varies with the angle, and this is this this factor here is what we call the scattering the scattering amplitude. So here I've once again I've chosen z as the beam axis, so that's why I have I have that that plane wave uh, there. And so the question is, um, why do we look at this kind of 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 of, of system? And so to interpret that that structure, I re I recall you the notion of of probability currents in quantum mechanics. And uh, in order to study that, uh, we'll look at each of the, so we have two terms and we'll look at each of the term uh, separately. So the first term, so the first term, uh, if I apply that, uh, it, it actually corresponds as, as we'll see in a minute uh, to uh, the incoming, 
to the incoming beam. Okay, it's it's just the incoming the incoming wave. So the starting the starting the starting uh, the, the starting channel the incoming channel of the of the of the reaction. And to 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 show that, uh, let's define a current that I will call J i, uh, and which is in this case one over mu, the real part of uh, that wave function, so e at the power minus e z k z, okay, that's the complex conjugate, uh, main minus i h bar gradient um, e at the power i k z, and I always forget uh, the 2 pi 3 half, 2 pi at the power three half, okay? Now we can, is this here is not very difficult because you depend only on Z. So there is only the component, the Z component of the gradient that you need to consider. And so what happens uh, is that uh, you get um, um, one over mu, the real part of here, I still have my plane wave, um, kz divided by 2 pi at the power 3 half. Um, so when I de derived that with regard to z, I got i k um, as a factor. The i cancels with the minus i, so I have h bar, h bar k coming here, and I still have this plane wave e k z divided by 2 pi at the power uh, three half, okay? Now, these two cancel out um, and I'm I'm left with, uh, I'm just left with uh, one over two pi at the power, at the power three, H bar, sorry. One z. Of course, it's a it's a vector. It should it should stay a vector. So that's only the direction. When I call what I mean here is the direction of z. So it's the z direction. Um, h bar k divided by divided by by mu in the direction of 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 z. And this is actually proportional to the relative velocity of the two incoming particle so um, it's the a b relative velocity and so this is why we can consider that this part this first this first term corresponds to the incoming plane wave because the flux the probability flux is directed in the direction of the flux of of the of the incoming beam and it's it's proportional to the uh, to the initial velocity uh, now what what happens when i look at the second uh, at the second term the second term will correspond to uh, the scattering the scattered the scattered wave uh, and to to see that uh, i will define a scattered density, um, which is once again one over mu, real part of, and now I take the outgoing wave, the sorry, the uh, the, the, the the spherical the, the spherical wave, e k r divided by r, and I don't have to forget the two pi at the power of three. Uh, three half, and I still have the grad gradient, and then f of minus here, um, f k. So the scattering amplitude, e k r divided by r and two pi at the power of three half. Now I don't. This is the asymptotics of, of the solution. So I don't care, yeah.
No, momentum over mass is velocity. Yeah. And so that mean that makes that makes sense. Uh well actually this here has a dimension because it's a wave function. Well, there is no notion of volume here, it's a scaring state. So um because of where am I uh, here? Because of because of that, because of, 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 of this, actually this two pi at the power one minus three half has a dimension because when you integrate that you get you, you get a delta function. Okay? So um this so when you integrate this over over the, the, the volume, so the square, you, you get you get so you should have this has the unit of a volume, uh, yeah, square, square, the, yeah, the square root of a volume. So the product is a one over the volume. Yeah. Okay. And so we have a velocity divided by, uh, divided by a volume, and said that that's the dimension of a flux. So that makes sense. Um. So, um, yeah, what I was saying here is that you only look at the asymptotic part. So we don't really need to look at the derivative against uh, uh, with with regards to to theta or to phi, because and and we just need to have the the leading term. So we will just look at the leading term of of that of that gradient. So the gradient, if you if you remember the 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 the, the gradient expressed in, in spherical coordinate is the derivative over r in the direction of r plus one over r and then different things and you have the derivative over over theta and uh, the and and the derivative over 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 phi uh, one. Uh, one phi, and because of that one over r, we actually don't care about that because we look at what happens when r goes to infinity. So that term, uh, we will basically uh, neglect uh, that that part of the of the derivative. So we just look at the derivative over r, and within the derivative over r, here we see we have two factors, uh, <clears throat> and so when you derivate one over r, you get one over r square which is negligible over one over r when r goes to infinity. So we just need to look at the derivative of the, of the numerator. The, the denominator, denominator doesn't play any, any role. So what we, what we can write is that js is when r goes to, when r goes to infinity, it goes as one over mu the real part of um, my scattering amplitude, the complex conjugate of my scattering amplitude divided by two pi at the power of three half e to the minus i k r divided by r. So here, I don't have to worry about the derivative over theta. I don't have to worry about this one. So I just need to um, to derivate this this spherical this spherical wave this this exponential. The i cancel with the minus i. So what I have back is h bar k f k of theta divided by two pi and the power three half. Um, AKR over R, and this multiplies the direction of one uh, in, 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 in the radial outgoing, <clears throat> outgoing wave, plus actually one over R third, uh, term of, of one over R, R, R third. And so when I compute here again, what, what we can see is that these two will cancel out. Uh, and in the end, what we get is one over 
2 pi and the power 3. Um, h bar k divided by mu. Um, 1 over r square and then the square modulus of, of the scattering amplitude. And this should be in the direction of r plus once again 1 over r r3. So what happens here, it's that that, uh, that scattering, this is really the scattering wave. It's directed in the direction or in the radial outgoing direction. So the sign here is basic, is positive. So you go outwards. Um, it goes as one over R and it's also, once again, it is, it is proportional to this relative velocity. So it goes exactly at the same velocity as, as, as the incoming wave. And that's normal. We are looking at elastic scattering. So everything that comes in has to come, go out and it goes out at exactly the same velocity. So here is a summary of what, what we've just seen. So the incoming current is proportional to the velocity in the direction of the beam. And the, this, this term here describes the scattering the scattering current and it's proportional to the velocity it goes as one over r and uh it's it it moves outwards but it is affected it changes it varies with the angle as a function of this uh this scattering uh this scattering scattering angle so what you have is that here you have an incoming plane wave which is your e to the power a chi uh, e to the power i k z and then you have an outgoing radial wave that comes that comes out here which is which depends on uh on the angle and a k r over uh over r so that's 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 the that's the one that is that is moving outside and so this depends this is what we want to uh what we want to look at. So all the information about the potential that is here is actually uh, encoded in this in this scattering amplitude, and so that's what <clears throat> that's what we need to uh, that's what we need to measure. So how do we compute the the cross the cross section? Um, so the idea is to say that the incoming flux is proportional to this, if you treat that quantum mechanically, is just a constant times uh, this, this um, the, the modulus of this, of this incoming current, okay? That's the, that's the incoming flux. So if you describe that quantum mechanically, that's exactly what will happen in a, in a, in a, in a collision. And then you have a flux, an outgoing, a scattered flux, and we'll do exactly the same thing. We'll say it's just proportional to this um, to the scattering uh, to the scattering current. Um, with the same, with the same, it's 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 the, these two are the same uh, the same factor of proportionality, and the reason is that everything that comes in has to come out. We'll see later uh, next tomorrow. We'll see how how to include other channels in, 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 in a phenomenological, uh, phenomenological way. So if we go back to this, this idea of you have, um, you have your incoming wave uh, here, and then you have your, your detector, which is located here at a certain uh, scattering, at a, at a, at a certain uh, scattering, scattering angle. Um, then the scattering flux gives us the number of events that we will actually measure. So it, it, it says that the number of event is just Fc, F, Fs, sorry, times the angular aperture of, of your uh, of your of your of your detector. So this uh, this delta omega that you have here, uh, and that gives you exactly that gives you the uh, the number of particle. So um, if I want to measure the the, the cross section, uh, the, the 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 differential cross section, what I need to do is take that delta n and divide it by f i times n 
in this case, because we do a quantum mechanical calculation, we will assume that you have one diffuser, just one particle. Uh, this is a, an ideal experimental device. You have just one nucleus uh, in, 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 in the target. Um, delta omega, this, this opening angle is actually R square. So that's where the, 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 it's the distance between the target and the um, and and the detectors um, uh, where am I? no sorry it's delta s not the op the, the 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 opening angle but it's the surface of the detector sorry um and so it's the surface of the detectors, and that surface of the detector here is R squared times the opening, the opening angle of the of the detector. Okay, seen from from the target. Sorry for the, the mishap. Uh, and so what I have here is Fs times R square delta omega divided by, uh, and this is divided by delta omega fi, n is equal to one, and I have delta omega here. So what I can do is just cancel these, these two. If I go back here to look at what, well, it's here actually, um, to look at the, um, I, what, what, uh, what, what, what I have, what, what I have here, the, um, this is, okay, so it's, C G S time R square divided by C G I. And so and so uh, this will be um, V uh, F K T the, the scattering amplitude, the square of the of the of the scattering amplitude, I forget the two pi uh, at the power three because they appear on uh, above and 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 below, one over r square, r square, and it's divided by something which is proportional to v. So these two velocity cancel each other. The r square that disappear, and what you have is that in the end. d sigma over d omega is the square modulus of this scattering amplitude. And so everything we want to learn, and we, everything we can learn about the interaction between the two particles, so all the information that you have about the interaction between the particle is encoded in the, into this the scattering wave, okay? So, uh, so that, that's what you can, you can actually, actually measure uh, experimentally, and so that's what where you can get information about about the interaction, the 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 interaction between the particles. So now we have a sort of a of a theoretical way to get this cross section. The question is, how do we solve uh, the Schrödinger equation? So there are different ways to solve the Schrödinger equation. Um, <clears throat> you can do the Born approximation. Um, I will look here. At, at the partial wave, at the partial wave expansion, and the partial wave expansion the, works very well if your potential does not depend on the on 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 the angle. So if if you have a center of potential, which is usually the case, so it depends only on the distance between the two particles. And so in that case, the Hamiltonian uh, commutes with uh, the orbital angular momentum and its uh, uh, projection over 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 z, and the uh, eigenstate of L square and L z are uh, spherical harmonics. So this is something you should have seen in quantum mechanics, and so you can expand the wave function onto these these wave function, and um, this is the expression then of 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 the wave function. And the this function of the radius is the solution of a radial equation, which is which is written written here, and this can be solved numerically, and this is exactly what we are going to do uh, on Thursday. Well, that the program 
this old Fortran program will do for us. So we solve, solve the Schrodinger equation. So just passing by, this is a way that, so you remember we started with six dimension problem, three for the position of A, three for the position of B. We've reduced that to three by removing the center of the motion of the center of mass. And now we have solved the angular problem. So this, the two, the, the, the solution of the angle problem have been solved. And so we are reduced to just solving one radial equation. So we went from six dimension to basically one. So we need to solve that problem. Uh, so that that's, that's strongly simplifies uh, the, uh, the issue. So that's one of the gain that we have uh, that we have here. Uh, when you talk about uh, partial wave expansion, uh, one notion that comes out is, is, is this notion of phase shift, which is very important and, and I want to introduce it uh, here. So the cross section, as we've seen, uh, is obtained from the scattering amplitude and the scattering amplitude comes from uh, the asymptotic uh, part of the, of the wave function. So let's assume we are doing nuclear physics. So we are looking for short range interactions. So this is an interaction that has a few Fermi range, not much more. <clears throat> so we will just assume that the potential is short range in the sense that it decreases much faster than one over R squared. It's basically an exponential. We know that, that it, it works fine. And so the asymptotic part of the wave function is the solution of that wave function, of, of that Schrodinger equation. It's exactly that Schrodinger equation here where I have removed that, that part of the, of the potential. The reason why we compare the potential to R squared is because you have the centrifugal term here, which comes from the orbital angular momentum. So that's the orbital angular momentum contribution to uh, <clears throat> to the kinetic uh, to to the the, the 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 kinetic energy term, and very happily, very smart people solved that problem exactly centuries ago, um, and and the solution of that are uh, spherical Bessel functions, and so these functions you have, it's a second order. Uh, differential equations. So you have two solutions, two independent solutions, JL and NL. And they also have a very simple asymptotic behavior. So uh, your asymptotic, uh, the, the asymptotic wave function behaves as a linear combination of a sine and a cosine uh, solution. So it's basically waves uh, evolving. So at a large distance, the particle is basically free and it, and it, and it, and it evolves uh, as 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 a free as a free wave, but not fully wave, fully 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 free. Um, if I do a, a change of variables, so I change, uh, I I use an amplitude C L, and uh, I define a new variable delta L, which is my phase shift. And so by doing that, I reduce this linear combination of a sine and a cosine e two. A normalization factor. We'll discuss that later times a sine function, uh, which has exactly the same behavior as this one, but it's simply phase shifted. And that's the influence of the potential. If, the, if, if, there, are, if there were no potential, um, you can demonstrate that B has to be zero. Um, and so therefore the, the sine delta L has to be zero. So sine, the, 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 the phase shift has to be nil. And so once <clears throat> when this is shown, then you are going back to a, to a basically to a plane wave. So that's what I wanted to uh, to discuss uh, to show here uh, on a more um, on a, on a, on a graphic graphic way. So uh, these these initial so the the distorted wave. So the wave have come. So you have the plane wave, and then it goes out, and it's it, it, it is distorted, it is a phase shifted. So that's why the wave is distorted and it's phase shifted compared to the plane wave, which is, which is just a sine, a sine function. Um, and so what it means is that um, if you look at, so we don't really care about, we don't really care about what's going on at, <clears throat> at short uh, at short distances, but 
in the asymptotic part, what we have is a wave. Okay, so this, this would be our plane wave with no phase shift. So the phase shift is, is equal to zero. Then you have two possible cases. The first one is that the phase shift is positive. What does that mean? Well, if the phase shift is positive, uh, then the this, this asymptotic part of the wave function moves to the left. And so you will have a wave that has exactly the same kind of of behavior, but uh, that is simply uh, shifted to the left. And if it's shifted to the left, so this means that my phase shift here is positive, it means that the potential will be attractive. The particles tend to stick together, so they are phase shifted and they come out um, slightly, uh, slightly later than the, than the, than the play wave. Another possibility is that the phase shift is um, the, sh the phase shift is is negative, and so in that case the wave behaves like this, and it means that the potential is repulsive. The particle come out earlier than the plane wave because they interact with each with each uh, they interact with each other. So here is, this summarizes what I've just mentioned. When the potential is nil, no phase shift, no shift, the, 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 it's, it's just a plane wave. The particle do not interact with each other. So they just behave as a plane, as a plane wave. When the potential is negative, um, it means that the phase shift becomes positive. The waves are attracted by the field and the, coll the colliding particle tend to stick slightly together. When the potential is positive, it means that it's repulsive. The phase shift will be negative, and the, the wave will be uh, repulsed by the by 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 the shift. So the the particles stick uh, stay away from one uh, from one another. Uh, an, another way to see it see this a little bit better is to look at this phase to to rewrite that behavior using incoming and outgoing spherical waves. So um, I just use the definition of this, uh, the, the expression of the sign as function of, in, of, of negative and, and positive um, uh, complex uh, exp exponential, okay? So this, is, this would be the incoming uh, wave and this is the outgoing wave as we've seen um, before. And they are phase shifted by twice, twice the phase shift. So this corresponds to the incoming wave, so the, 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 the particle come close to each other, they interact, something happens because of the interaction, and then they come out. And uh, they come out, by coming out, it, it, it is phase shifted. And that's the only thing that you can measure. You can't measure what's, what's going on really close to each, to, to each other to when the two particles interact at the Fermi level. You, only, you can only measure what happens when the particles are very far from, uh, from, uh, from each other. And so, and and this is so the effect of 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 all the effect of V has to be encoded into this phase shift. So the question is, since the cross section is obtained from the scattering amplitude, we should be able to compute the scattering uh, amplitude from uh, from the phase shift, and that's exactly what we are uh, going to do. So the scattering wave function, this is the, this, this is the scattering wave function, so developed as a function of uh, spherical harmonics. And it has, we look for solutions that have exactly that, uh, that, that, that behavior in the final, in the final uh, this, this asymptotic solution. Plane wave can be expanded into spherical harmonics as well. So it's a little bit complicated, but it's not. It's not very bad. So what you see is that you also have an incoming wave, an outgoing wave. You have this uh, spherical harmonics, and you have a co uh, coefficient here. Looks horrible, but it's uh, it's just math. It's not shouldn't be worried about about that. Now, as we've just seen, um, 
u, so the solution of the Schrodinger equation, the, the numerical solution of the Schrodinger equation, has a, a, a behavior which is which is which is like this. So what we can do is what we want to do is to know exactly what's the value of this coefficient here and what's the value of this uh, of, of of the phase shift here. So we can determine the coefficient by making a comparison between this expression here and this expression. And when you do that, when you identify, when you put this expression here into that, into that, uh, in, into that, that expansion, then you can get a value of the uh, of of the uh, of the incoming wave, and you obtain that uh, you, you obtain that expression. I won't go through the math. You can check that and come back uh, if you have if you have issues. Uh, and so, once you have these these phase shifts for looking at this outgoing wave and co comparing this outgoing wave and this outgoing wave, you can have a, an expression of the uh, scattering amplitude uh, from uh, from from the from the S matrix on, from the collision matrix, so from the from the from the phase shift. Uh, that's what that's what you get. So you can get the cross. You can get the scattering amplitude from directly from from the phase shift as a combination of spherical harmonics or um, Legendre uh, polynomials. So what what we want to get in the end is this is this cross section. So it's the square modulus of this uh, of 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 this of this expression that we have uh, that we have that we have here. So. It's one over four k square square models of the sum over L of square root of four pi to L plus one. This is these long coefficient that I've mentioned, S L minus one, Y L zero of omega square models. And we can obtain by we can obtain by integrating over omega, we can obtain the total cross section, which is then one over four k square integral over omega of the square, this square models, which is a, can be expressed as a double sum, sum over L prime, sum over L. We have four pi square root of two L prime plus one square root of two L plus one. SL complex conjugate prime, sorry, SL minus one. And we have um, YL zero complex conjugate, YL zero omega. And actually, because of orthogonality uh, of, of the uh, This integral here depends um, is equal to delta L L prime by orthogonality of the uh, spherical harmonics. So my double sum becomes a single sum, and what I get in the end is uh, one over four k square sum over sorry. pi over k square sum over L. I move the, 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 the pi outside of the sum to L plus one, um, SL minus one square modulus, uh, and that's it. Yep. So SL is e to the power two I delta L. So I can express it directly as a function of the of the of the of the phase shift, um, and so this should give me four. Sorry, yeah, pi. Now, 
Yeah, I, that's pi. And so what I get in the end is four pi divided by is k squared, sum over, thank you, someone is following, two uh, L plus one sine square of, uh, of delta L. And so this is, um, this shows that you can get that you can get the cross section directly from uh, from that phase shift. Now, <clears throat> I said you we went from six dimension to three and then to one, but you will say the problem is it's not true. You still have a sum over L and you have an infinite number of partial waves. Um, so can we finish this? Okay, uh, is, is this some limited? So yes, um, each partial wave contributes to the cross section, but uh, they're not all equal. So some partial wave contributes more than, 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 than others. Um, and so here is an example of this, what we call the effective potential. When I, when I mentioned the effective potential, what I mean by that is it is the potential plus uh, plus the centrifugal term uh, plus the centrifugal term, and what you see is that when L increases, so for L equals zero, you just have your nuclear potential. L equals one, you have a strongly repulsive core, and then you see this barrier appear here. And the the higher you go, the less distorted. Uh, that that effective potential is. And so it means that the higher you go in L, the less important it becomes because the effect of that attractive, in this case, attractive potential is, uh, is, is hindered by, by, by the centrifugal term. And at one point, it, it, won't, it won't happen. So what we, this centrifugal barrier ensures us that the phase shift uh, goes, to, uh, goes to zero when L goes to infinity. At the limit, when you are at very low energy, only L equals zero will 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 contribute, and the cross section will just have that uh, that that behavior. So you just need to get the the phase shift in one partial wave. So you solve one radial Schrodinger equation, and you get you get your cross uh, you get your cross section. And uh, at higher energy, the higher you go, the more you you probe the the the, the easier you enter that centrifugal barrier and you still have an influence of this uh, short range nuclear interaction. And that means that <clears throat> uh, you need to include more uh, partial waves. So uh, the, the higher you go in energy, the, 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 the more partial waves you need to include. So this method is more uh, a low energy method than a high energy method. When you have a high energy, it's better to rely on the Born approximation, for example. So the question is, how do you compute this phase shift? Uh, you need to solve the Schrodinger equation. And then you know that you can separate, because you have a short range potential, you can separate your space into two parts. A short range part, whether uh, an external part, the dominant one, so the external part where the potential is nil. So you say, OK, the interaction does not happen and I know exactly how uh, how the, uh, the the wave function behaves uh, there so I know the solution the analytic solution I, I know it at in the external part in the internal part when you are within the range of the nuclear interaction there you cannot neglect the potential and you need to solve that that that, that equation and this is something that you can do numerically using for example the numeroff methods uh, there are other ways to solve to solve that problem. Um, you can use Lagrange mesh uh, methods, um, whichever method that you that you prefer. But at the boundary, what you need you know is that at the boundary, if R not, so this this boundary between the two region is large enough, then you can know that these two uh, should be should be equal. So the, your numerical solution, so the internal wave function, your numerical solution should equate that known. Uh, expression outside and if you just want to get the phase shift and, and you know that these should be continuous and the first order derivative should also be continuous and so one way is to use logarithmic um, deriv derivatives which 
enables you to get rid of this uh, of this of this coefficient here. And what you get in the end is uh, you you can get you can get the phase shift by just equating the numerical solution of your equation and the asymptotic part of the of of, of the solution which which you which you know analytically. Okay, so that's exactly actually what what the code that I gave you does for a complex potential. It solves the numerical equation up to a certain place, and then it uh, it equates that that wave function using the number of technique up to a certain point, and at that point, it's uh, it 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 equates uh, the two wave functions and the derivatives, and and from there it extracts the value of the uh, of the of the of the phase shift. Okay. Are there questions up to here? Yeah. Yeah. That's why theoreticians never work in the lab frame. Uh, <clears throat> so this is a good question because it's usually it's it's a big problem when you have to move back to the lab frame so some data for example are given in the lab frame because that's where you measure things uh, most of exp the experimentalists are expert in doing that so they know how to move from the the lab to 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 the center of mass the theoretician work in the center of mass they don't work in the lab Sometimes it's better that they do not even approach the lab. But <clears throat> so usually we rely, we as theoretician, we rely on the experimentalist who give us the cross section or yeah, everything given in 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 the uh, in the center of mass. But some data are given in the lab. And so in that case, we have to do the work and move uh, towards in, in 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 the lab, in the lab frame. Yeah. So you could have cross sections that are given as a function of the scattering angle, not in the center of mass, but in the lab. And so you have to, there is a formula to do that. So it's it's not difficult, it's just, yeah, you need to be, you need to know exactly what you're doing. And, but yeah, usually we work in the, in, in, in the center of mass. Yeah. That's tomorrow's lecture. So as you, as you'll see, Coulomb is a mess. It it because of the wrong range. So we we've said we've assumed that the potentially short range, and this is true for the nuclear interaction. But nuclei, unless you work with neutrons, um, nuclei interact are charged. And well, fortunately, otherwise we wouldn't be here. But um, for us, for the calculation, it makes everything a bit more complicated. But otherwise, the, the, the general idea explained today remains the same. But we'll see that to, uh, tomorrow then. Uh, and so the phase shift is not only something that you can ex compute. It's not just a purely theoretical uh, value. It It's actually... I'm not sure you can call that observable. This is this is something that we we can debate uh, about which we can debate, but it's something that you can infer from the data. And actually, your wave function can be expressed as a function of the genre polynomial. And so, what you do is you if you expand your wave function on the genre polynomials, you can you can get um, you you can get experimental phase shift. So this is something that you can uh, that you can actually uh, get. So what are the properties of this phase shift? The first thing is that it's a continuum function of uh, of energy. Um, that's 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 something. To, so you can build a phase shift in a way that it's continuum function of the energy, um, and at and it is uh, k to the power two l plus one times the cotangent of the phase shift is analytical in e in in the energy. So what 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 this means is that k at the power 2L plus 1 cotangent delta L is can be expressed as a constant 1 plus a constant 2E plus constant uh, 3. Yeah, that's not a good choice. C0, C1, E, C2, 
e square plus etc and so that gives you a way to get to know how what how the, the phase shift behaves at low energy so at low energy at, so by convention uh when you go to high energy your phase shift should tend to zero and the reason this is this is consistent with the fact that the phase shift is nil when the potential is nil when the potential is nil um the phase shift should be should be zero even if your potential is not nil when you go to high energy it becomes completely negligible with the kinetic energy so you can neglect it so the, that's why the phase shift is, is zero at low energy because of that uh analyticity of of the of of of, of that function of the of the phase shift we know that the phase shift behaves uh, at the origin as k at the power 2l plus 1. Um, the phase shift, the value of the phase shift between zero and infinity is also related to the number of bound states of the potential hosts in that partial waves. And so the difference between the phase shift at the origin and at infinity is an L times pi, where an L is the number of bound state in the partial wave L. Okay. And you can also demonstrate that when one potential is larger than another one at all the value, the phase shift is lower than, 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 than the phase shift in these other uh, potential at all energies. And so one, there are two applications, something that we've seen well, I'm not sure it was very clear, but anyway, uh, that when the potential is attractive, the phase shift will be positive. So we'd, we've seen that this wave function, well, for you, is, is shifted towards the sh short distances. And when the potential is repulsive, when it's positive, uh, the phase shift is negative. So it means that the wave, this wave function is pushed away from, the, uh, from, uh, from, uh, from zero. And so in general, as I mentioned, the phase shift should go to zero when L goes to infinity because of that centrifugal barrier. So you, you, you increase the value of L, you reduce the influence of, of, of the short range potential on these waves when, when, L, uh, when L grows. So can I have another five minutes? Yeah, okay. So here is an example. Um, it's, it's a work of, of, of this group. Um, where they use this phase shift exactly as what was said in the previous lecture. So you use numerical data. So the phase shift, in this case, it's uh, proton neutron phase shifts for different partial wave waves. Now, of course, this is a realistic calculation. So they include the spin. So you have in the channel, the, the notation of the channel is L. So the, 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 the centrifugal, the orbital angular momentum we've mentioned in the usual um, spectroscopic notation S for L equals zero, P for L equals one, D for L equals two, etc. cetera. Um, the upper uh, left index is twice S plus one, where S is the total spin. So total spin between a proton and a neutron can be either zero or one. So that value is either one or three. Uh, and then in the lower right index is the total angular momentum, which is obtained from the combination of the orbital angular momentum and the uh, spin uh, and the spin channel. And so what I want to show here is is that actually it illustrates very well what what we've just said. The first is that the data are represented by these red crosses that you can see uh, here. These are ex export extracted from scattering data. Um, and the the but but the sun the blue solid line is actually the result of the calculation that they have done. So they have fitted a new the proton neutron interaction in order to reproduce these data. And what we see first is that the wave function is indeed continuum continuous with with the energy. We, there is no disruption of 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 these uh, of of these phase shift. Um, yeah, we never go to infinity, but what we see is that it's basically usually reduced when you go to higher energy. But here it's it's limited to 350 MeV, so uh, we 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 never really approach uh, infinity. At very low energy, you have this behavior. So it means that the higher you go in L, um, the smoother the, the 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 phase shift should start at at zero. And this is actually what you see. You see, for example, this is a G wave. Um, 
So that's L equals four. Um, and you, you see that the, that, that in, it, it initiates the phase shift it's, is nearly flat at the beginning and then it grows only much, much later because it, it goes at, as uh, K to the power uh, five, uh, nine, sorry, L equal four. Um, <clears throat> but on the other hand, you see that in the P wave, for example, you have, you have a, a, a rather sharp uh, start of, of the of the phase shift even sharper here in the in the three uh, f three uh, s one, so this is really what what we see, and when you go to higher, for example, you, if you start here from the from the s wave, you see a, 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 a significant change in the phase shift about well, ninety degrees or so over three hundred uh, MeV. If you go on the other hand, if you go to the last one here, which is an i uh, wave, so it's uh, um, L equals six. Um, you see that uh, over 350 um, MeV, it changes only by one degree. So you really have a decrease of, of the phase shift uh, when you go move higher in uh, in, uh, in in partial waves. So I talked a lot, and so here is a question. So knowing these properties. What can you say about the potential between the proton and the neutron in these two different partial waves? So the um, this would mean this one is else the, the total spin equals one and j the total angular momentum is zero and here the spin sorry s is zero because it's two s plus one and here s is one and j equals uh, and j equals equals one, and it's both l l equals zero in both in both cases. So, what 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 can you say about about the interaction f starting from the properties we've just seen? So if we look here at the at the beginning of the wave function, for example, uh, the, sorry, the the, the 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 low energy the low energy value of the of the of the phase shift. Here you it seems that you start at sixty. We don't see here the 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 short the 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 the, the, the low energy actually it starts it starts from zero it goes up. And here, but here it doesn't start from zero. It starts from pi. Why? Why this difference? So if we start from the so the Levinson um, theorem uh, says that delta L from zero minus delta L from infinity, and this is equal to zero, is NL pi, and this is the number of bound states that you have. What is that bound state here? Sorry? Here? No. So that means here that you have a bound state. And that's the deuterium. And the deuterium has a spin one. So that's true. Parity plus, it's an S wave. So L equals zero. So the parity is positive. So it makes sense. Um, in this case, there is no bound state. That's actually the T, the isospin equals one. And there is no bound state, there is no diproton, there is no, no dineutron. So that's the wave where there is no bound state. Uh, the, there is no bound state. There is no um, zero plus proton neutron bound state. Uh, you only have the deuteron, which is bound by two, by two energy. Yeah. It's. You, we don't see it, but it starts from zero and it rises very quickly. 
and then. And the reason is you nearly have the di the, the you nearly have a bound state of two protons, two neutrons, and 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 in this case proton neutron. You have a scattering length. Well, you 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 have nearly it's nearly a bound state. Uh, that that you have it's slightly above the threshold it's not bound it's slightly above threshold if it were bound by zero it would start from 90 degrees in this case but okay no no that's why i avoid this 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 notion um what about the sign the sign here of it's what what is the sign of that of that phase shift sorry so it means that the potential is mostly attractive, which makes sense. We know that protons and neutrons in the end get 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 attracted. But what we see here is that it crosses zero at larger energy. And actually we don't see it here, but it, it goes it goes below zero as well. Why is that? What 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 is the sign of that? Yeah. What can we learn from that? Yeah? When? So, um, uh, so at low energy, the phase shift is positive, and so we can say that it's not fully it's not a, a, a demonstration, but it means that the neutron proton uh, interaction is mostly uh, attractive uh, for the long long range part because it's the low energy. And the phase shift is negative at large energy. And so we can say that the potential will become repulsive um, on on the short short range. Okay. And this is what we have. Um, these are realistic NN interactions. Uh, so we have the C D bond, uh, we have the read potential, we have argon V18. So these are these interaction that were introduced in the previous lecture, which are not based on chiral symmetries, or it's partly in included in there, but it's just in it's it's an effective interaction that is there to reproduce what I've just mentioned. So these phase shift, and what we see here is that this is the one S zero channel. I don't have the picture for the S three uh, for the three S, but three uh, S one. But what we see is that at large distance, we have a smooth potential that is mostly attractive. And so exactly as what you've seen in the at the end of the last lecture, at the large distance, you have a one pion exchange, and that's where that's what brings the, the attraction. Shorter distances, you can you start to be able to exchange a two pion. You can also exchange row masons, heavier. Uh, masons can start to play to play a role, but then what you see is that when you are within the range of the Fermi, which is the size of basically the the, the nucleon, you have a, a, a strongly repulsive uh, core that appears, and that has a signature in the phase shift uh, at at high energy. When when you, you really probe that part, then you see that the potential start to be uh, to be negative when the protons and the neutron really collide to each other. And 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 this this repulsion comes from the structure of the protons and neutrons. They are made up of quarks, and because of the Pauli principle, they they don't want to be in the same space uh, at the same at the same place. And so you you have to have a repulsive behavior uh, at the short uh, at the short at the short distances. But you have it's not just something that is invented by the people doing nuclear physics. It's something that you can see from the data and it comes from the fact that you have a negative phase shift in, in the S wave uh, at, at large at large distances. So that's that's the reason.
Yeah, 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 of course, yeah. So that that's that's the demonstration of the presence of this tensor force and uh, and uh, spin orbit uh, spin orbit part. So I think I will stop here, um, and we'll see the notion of resonance tomorrow. So I don't know if you have any question, urgent question. Yes. that a potential is not an observable. So um, I don't I don't think that they really include the uh, the, the 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 experimental uncertainty in these in, in these in these value. I took it because I like everything is there. Uh, I think it shows that different potential can reproduce exactly the same they, they all agree they all produce reproduce these phase shifts uh to up to very high energy and so it shows that a potential i want i i will never stress it strong enough it's it's not an observable so it's just a way an effective way to describe to describe reality uh, reality is something something else so uh it's Different way to parameterize the, the 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 potential lead to different shapes, even if they reproduce exactly the same uh, the the same the same physical observable. We'll see another example on that on the on on the notion of optical potential tomorrow. So, if no longer question, I suggest we all rush to the canteen and have a a good lunch. Thank you. <laughs>